I have an extremely complex uh, URL and Twitter username. It's Ernie Miller. Um, I work for a company called Apris. And just stick on. I work for a company called Apris, and I would really like you to ask me about them because I want them to continue to send me to things like this. So please do catch me after the talk. So this talk, uh, almost two years ago, I started thinking about giving this talk. Um, and I had never given a talk at that point. And um, that was a little bit weird for me because I kind of figured, well, I know I've done lots of stupid things, right? And so <laughs> if I could give a talk, this would probably be what it was about. And I got to admit, that actually scares me. Like, I've given six talks last year. Not a single one of those six talks was about at least these particular stupid things I've done. And that's kind of difficult for me because I really want this talk to be uh, real talk, right? So in case you're not familiar with real talk, it's, uh, it's talk, but you can tell it's real because it says so in the, front of the, in the front of the word, right? It's kind of like the real Ghostbusters or uh, the real Slim Shady, right? Uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, I'm, about 30 seconds ago, I mentioned I had done a lot of stupid things, right? Um, exhibit A, uh, I'm an expert at making mistakes. I'm happy to share as many as I can in a 45-minute time slot. So I got the time slot wrong right on the abstract that's on the website. Um, so take away from this one, first, don't. Don't overestimate how much time you have. And so that works on the small, right? Like, I mean, if you're trying to estimate a project, right, you try not to overestimate the amount of time that you're actually going to be able to have to complete the thing, right? But those of you who know me may have known that I had a reason this year to kind of think about that, or last, late last year, uh, week before Thanksgiving, to think about this a little bit more deeply. I uh, got diagnosed with uh, testicular cancer last year. and. Uh, you know, as cancer goes, actually, testicular cancer is a pretty fun one to have, uh, mainly because you get to make all kinds of horrible jokes, and nobody can say anything to you because it's like, cancer? I mean, what are you going to do, right? So, so these were a few of, a few of my favorites. <laughs> uh, so I, I had a lot of fun with this. Um, Yeah, the nurses at the, the cancer ward really liked that one, actually. Um, so, and I got to give the most epic Friday hug ever, for me, anyway. So, so I mean, I guess <laughs> all this cancer fun aside, let me just go back to uh, don't overestimate how much time you have. There are a lot of things that I've thought about um, since then that I've been really thankful that I've been able to do. Uh, chief among them, all the speaking I got to do last year. I was like, you know what, if I go, at least I achieve some pretty big goals, right? Um, and not only that, I would like to ask every one of you in this room to do me a favor um, sometime before the night is over. Find someone who has made a positive impact on your life and thank them for it. It's really, really awkward at first because usually the internet's all about complaining, right? But <laughs> find someone that you can say something positive to, that you can, you can thank for whatever. It's going to be weird. They're going to look at you like, are you coming on to me? What's going on here? <laughs> it's OK. Just ride that out. And eventually, you'll find out that um, it may make a difference. I've, I've been really shocked the kinds of differences it made for people that didn't realize that anybody was paying attention. I mean, every time I see Aaron, I'm like, dude, I don't know how you do it. How do you stay on the Rails core team without like, freaking out, like doing all the stuff that you have to do? I'm very thankful for Aaron. I think most of us are. Um, <laughs> He freaks out in a very subtle way then. At least we don't see it. Um, so when I was a kid, I loved these things. Uh, I liked the fact that there was a surprise in them. Uh, I liked the fact that you're looking at me like, where's he going with this? Um, I liked the fact, uh, particularly, I loved sticky hands. I thought these things were the best toys ever. Truth be told, I still think they're the best toys ever. Um, they are awesome. Try one out if you haven't. Um, so you all probably have used one of these before. No, not the keyboard, smart Alex. A wrist rest, Jill wrist rest, right? 16 years ago or so, uh, I had one of these things, and it started to fall apart on me. And I made the most amazing discovery ever. <laughs> you, you have no idea. The inside of these things is a giant sticky hand. 
And so we had one, and, we, and you know, the guys at the office just thought it was hilarious, right? We loved this thing. You'd fling it against the wall, and it would stick there and leave horrible stains. And, um, and we named ours Roderick. And so Roderick got a lot of play in the office. He got to visit everybody because everybody loved Roderick, right? So um, I, uh, I spent about $50 buying wrist rests, trying to you know, find one that was just like Roderick. And unfortunately, there is only one Roderick. However, however, I did find one that was close. It unfortunately doesn't stretch quite the same. Ooh. They're super gross. But it stretches. It's like really stretchy. And I hope this won't stain. It... <laughs> Sticks. <laughs> it sticks. Ugh. It sticks. Right? This stuff is really cool. So here, you can totally pass this around and spread germs through the entire office, through the entire place there. Pass that, pass that nastiness around. So when we figured out that it could stretch, um, Roderick, anyway, had the special capability of stretching across an entire room. I mean, I'm talking from me to that exit sign over there. This thing would stretch. And... Uh, a buddy of mine, Jeff, uh, and I decided to see just how far we could stretch it. And uh, so I held Roderick on this end, right about here. He held Roderick on that end, right about there. Now, in physics, <laughs> there, are, there are two main kinds of energy. One of them is called potential energy. It's what's stored in that stretched rubber band right there. This is potential energy for business. The, <laughs> Now, I got this off of iStock. I actually paid for this photo because, I mean, who wouldn't, really? <laughs> and and, and this, this, of course, led me to need photos to use for kinetic energy. That is energy in motion, right? So I search on the internet for businessman flying, right? I t the treasure trove, man. <laughs> seriously? Seriously? Th this guy? This guy's loving it? S there is a ton of stuff in the end. If somebody hasn't set up a Tumblr for this, please do. Um, <laughs> businessmen flying, right? Um, I like this one particularly because even if you're flying to business, there's always time for coffee, <laughs> right? This guy I have here for an honorable mention. He's trying to fly. He's A for effort anyway, buddy, right? Okay? So I learned about potential and kinetic energy. And there's also this other thing in physics called gravity, right? So I refresh your memory. I'm holding, the, holding Roderick like this. My friend, so I think, is holding Roderick over there. He decides to let go. Now, potential energy quickly became kinetic energy, and gravity being what it is, you might imagine what happened next, where landfall was achieved, if you will. <laughs> um, so <laughs> on the bright side, I've got half the surface area for that particular attack vector at this point. So that's good, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, really, um, the choices that I made had consequences. Uh, had I had this to do over again, I may have made choices differently. Now, I'm not saying don't make choices that are potentially risky. There's a lot of reward in the risk-reward uh, balance whenever you t make a risky choice a lot of times. But think about what the consequences might be. Think ahead to how you might deal with them. Not like analysis paralysis, just think about it a bit. Because a lot of times, the choices that you make have a way of snapping back and inflicting great pain on you, either mentally or physically, right? So with that in mind, let's talk about metaprogramming. And um, I fell in love with metaprogramming. I think everybody goes through that phase, right, where it's like, oh, metaprogramming is so amazing. I can write programs to write programs. I'll automate myself out of a job. This is awesome. And I did that. Um, in fact, I was so silly that I wrote in a, a library uh, for, for Active Record called Metasearch. And uh, you'll see here that I said all the metaprogramming fun in writing it, right? In retrospect, I could have summed up that post like this. <laughs> um, so you may remember, uh, if you were at RubyConf, uh, I gave a talk where I talked about the uh, five rules for class macros that I tried to follow. So very briefly, the rules being described what, not, how. These are really just rules for being declarative, right? What, not, how, item potent, order independent, right? Um, straightforward and uh, free of branching if possible. So you can start to reason about what's happening, right? Um, I didn't do that at all. 
Um, I got the bright idea to have all of these uh, exclude attributes, exclude associations, include associations, class attributes that I then uh, gave class macros with branching in them for like if you do this, you can skip this because I kind of was on that metaprogramming kick, right? And so there's attribute searchable, attribute unsearchable, association unsearchable, associations searchable, right? And uh, all of that so that you could write something like this in your, uh, in your model. And um, <clears throat> later, I wrote another library that did basically the same things, only instead of all of that, I defined two methods that you can simply call and super, and, and you, know, you can subtract from them if you want, you can add to them if you want. You get the same behavior, but the, uh, the protocol that's now been established is like two methods. You don't have to think about, do I have to supply if to this? It's like, it's all just Ruby, right? Um, lesson I learned, don't fall in love with metaprogramming. It will break your heart or kill you in your sleep, probably both. Um, I also, in that same talk, um, kind of ranted about creating buckets of, of, of methods, right? Like that didn't have a, have a good home. And um, of course, here's code for Metasearch with a utility module. It's, it's great. Yeah. Don't be like me. Don't put your code in buckets. Um, there's a lot of value in coming up with names for things. That's why it's so hard to do, um, but it's really, really valuable. Um, and even after I fixed some of these problems as I started to write other libraries, right? Um, when you hitch your cart to, I'm gonna call this guy Bob, and I think his horse is Stella. I, I don't know what their real, real names are, but I don't know if Bob owns Stella, but if he doesn't, and someone else needs to take Stella away from him to do something else, like, I don't know, go horseback riding, right? Then what's he gonna be doing with his cart at that point? He's gonna be carrying it himself. I got a lot of frustration um, hitching my gems too tightly to Rails, right? I was tying into private APIs that, frankly, Rails had every right to change because they're private for a reason, right? And um, in order to do what I wanted to do, but it was extremely frustrating to try to handle fixing bugs that you didn't really introduce that just came about because of API changes. Um, and it wasn't you know, really a lot, a lot of fun to not be able to add features because I was trying to just keep up, right? Um, so there's ways even when you're coding your application to code defensively. Um, I like to think that there's a continuum in the way that we, uh, the way that we think. Basically that um, we think about an app sometimes, especially when we work from Rails first, we think about an app in terms of its schema, right? We think a lot about the different objects that are gonna be in the database that we're gonna persist. A lot of times we start there. The other side of that, of that continuum is there is no spoon, right? It's like, I can do anything, screw reality, I don't care about it, I can do anything I want. And I think that sometimes we err too far on the side of let's think about it as a database schema first, right? We think. Uh, too analytically about that and not enough about the domain, right? So I would encourage you not to think of your app necessarily as a Rails app, at least not at first, right? Write an app, um, you see this in the hexagonal Rails um, uh, kind of movement, but even apart from any specific way of accomplishing this, there's a lot of value in thinking about what is it I'm really trying to do first? Can I write some plain Ruby that does this, this task and tie in persistence later? And then you start to decide, well, what concessions am I willing to make to the framework? And is Rails the right framework for me? Or do I need a framework? Um, a lot of times I think our default start position, um, every time you make a choice, put it this way, every time you make a choice, you're narrowing down the options that you're gonna have later. So the real challenge in software development is to accomplish your goal while making the fewest choices possible, making the fewest decisions possible. If you can do that, you're leaving flexibility open for the future, right? Um, okay. so. Here's something that I blew way too much time on. I mentioned earlier, I've done a lot of stupid things. I'm gonna be vulnerable here, I'm trusting you all, okay? I spent probably three or four hours tracking down a problem with this. Um, now, to start, this is, this is a simple auditor class, right? It's a tiny little class that delegates to our record and audits what a user does to any kind of active record object, right? Um, in particular, one of the fun things about this is, and this is something I already knew, right? You have to override class to actually return back the records class, which is so evil, but you have to do it. Why, you ask? I'm glad you asked. 
Um, because of this piece of action view uh, in label, you can read all that, right? OK. Let's focus in on this piece. Of course you can. It's 40 lines. You can't read that. Um, and right in here, we have object.class.modelName.i18nkey. This is just to print out a label, right? So if we want to print out a label uh, in, our, in our view, um, we depend on the actual class itself to, to get an, a translation key, right? And so I wanted the, the, the object to behave like it was the active record object, but in order to do that, I, I also had to delegate class. That's a brief aside, right? OK. So um, I had, well, everything was great, right? And then we started to roll out some other changes. And let's just say it's a blog app, because I can't show you the code I actually used mostly for my own protection. And let's just say it's a blog app, and um, that here we have an auditor that we're actually substituting in place for a post. And we want to, in the view, link to comments. And uh, we pass it to post. And we think we're going to have the post ID in there. And what I actually got was this. I got the post ID over there, and I got the post ID on the end as well. So I got the post ID as part of the path, still ended up with it in the params. And I was like, well, why is this? And I spent probably longer than I should have, about two and a half, three hours digging through RailSource trying to figure out what was going on. Um, and it was bothersome to me, not only because I get OCD about things like this and dag on it, what the heck? Why is it showing it twice, even though it does the same thing? But also, I was using it in some JavaScript, and I was creating a path that appended to it, and so this was completely blowing the, 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 the path up. And so what I ended up doing was going in and finding uh, that in version 104 of Journey, I love Aaron. I'm not actually picking on Aaron at all, because this was my fault. There's a line in version 104 where we actually are subtracting um, the a certain set of params from another set of params, converting them to arrays and subtracting them, and then using the difference of that, right? I never defined uh, equality on my, on my object, right? So when you subtract two, two arrays, right, this one did not seem to be equal because the objects had the default object, uh, object ID implementation of equality. Um, quick fix, right? And uh, something like this is all it really took. But I spent three hours or more coming up with those six lines of code. Um, that kind of stuff happens. Um, try not to make assumptions about how people are going to use your objects. So I wanted to talk very, very briefly about callbacks. And um, <laughs> the, really, the really brief take on that is don't use them. Um, and you can almost always help, help it. Uh, I'm going to borrow a few slides from a RailsConf talk, shamelessly. If you want to do, say, a before save, you can do it simply by calling super. You can short circuit things. It's very impressive. You want to do an after save, very similar. It's amazing. It's amazing what we can do with modern technology. And you can even do around saves. And if you need to have like ifs or unlesses, you can totally do that. <laughs> OK, that's super easy. And you know, use callbacks as sort of a last resort because you will end up regretting them later because they seem super easy to reason about when you're just reading them at the top of one, one file. But once they start to relate, like, interact with one another, things get messy quick. All right, enough about code. Now let's talk about how I've screwed up in life. And boy, have I screwed up in life. All right, so there are probably a large number of people in this room who recognize one or both of those symbols, probably both. How many people have played World of Warcraft in here? OK, fair number of you. I played World of Warcraft. For those of you who have played World of Warcraft, I'm going to say something that's going to make you look upon me with pity. Um, this guy on the right here is me, kind of, my avatar. Uh, I ground to uh, a rank of Grand Marshal in the old PvP system. Now, for those of you who know what that means, toward the end of that grind, um, I actually had to put in about eight hours in game uh, to get the honor needed to, to rank up every single day, eight hours in game, in addition to my job, in addition to trying to find times to obtain sustenance and <laughs> otherwise you know, live a life that a normal human would, would, would have. Toward the end of this, um, in fact, the very first week I had started a new job, I was sitting in a meeting with my new coworkers and my new boss, almost falling asleep because I had only gotten three hours of sleep that night before because I had stayed up grinding honor in this system. Now, I'm sharing this with you because 
I have something of an addictive personality when I feel that I'm achieving something. And if I can harness that for good, if I can do things that actually mean that something, then that's great, right? Like if I really feel like I'm making a difference. But games like World of Warcraft, and I'm still an avid gamer, I love games, I stay the heck away from MMOs because they're wired in such a way to take people like me who basically get excited by leveling up or making some kind of an in-game achievement, right? They are wired to make people like me keep playing because I'll keep paying, right? Um, it's really important, and I learned that the hard way, uh, that you don't mistake the illusion of accomplishment for the real thing. There are, there are many systems in life that are set up to give you an illusion of progress, um, not just games, but in general. Um, real progress is something that's well worth, well worth spending many, many hours doing, but um, I learned the hard way that, uh, that you can waste a lot of your life doing something that ultimately is meaningless. Um, here's another thing. Um, <clears throat> counteroffers. You've probably all read at some point that you shouldn't accept counteroffers from an employer. Um, I have a particular story about that. Um, I had been working um, tech support initially, and then I started working for uh, systems administration at a mid-sized ISP in Pennsylvania. I had been working for $6.50 an hour at the time, and had been promised another 50 cents an hour if I stayed six months and showed you know, good progress. I was, I don't know, 19 at the time, so you know, what did I know? And I got another offer from another place, and so I went, I went to this other place because they offered me the money that I never saw from my employer, right? And I had this big argument with my employer on my way out, like, you know, he did me a favor by giving me a job, apparently, even though I did everything he paid me for. Went to this other place. Well, um, after a while, people kept saying, well, who did this? And who did this at my old job? Oh, Ernie did that. Oh, Ernie did that. And the guy was like, oh, well, crap, why did I let that guy go? And so uh, they came back and they, they offered me my job back at a significant pay raise at the time. I think it was like $10 an hour. I'm like, yeah, I'm being super transparent to you because you're all probably laughing at me because I was making $10 an hour, okay? So, so I, I, take, I take this offer and I say, well, that's a lot of money, <laughs> $10 an hour. And I went to my bosses. Uh, I was the only employee of this new like, small ISP that I had started with. I did everything for them, and I was making seven an hour, seven fifty maybe, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, it was a big raise. And uh, they said to me at the time, um, we will match it. If they come to you ever again with another offer, don't even come to us with it. It's... Just take it, leave. That's fine. So the thing about counteroffers is this. There's a poison in the relationship at that point. Um, if you've never done, been through this, you, you, I would rather spare you going through it. What happens is at that point, there's resentment on your side because now you know that they were paying you less than they apparently thought you were worth because they're willing to pay you now to keep you they now feel like we're paying way more than we used to for this guy. Um, you know, we're, we expect that much more work out of him, right? And there's that level of distrust there that, you know, they're just waiting for the next extortion, right? And even if you're well-intentioned about it, and even if you really want to stay there, horrible thing to do. I did it. I was 20 at the time. Don't accept counteroffers. Um, you'll only regret it. Now, when we're talking about money, there's another thing to consider, which is a lot of times, and I did this too, I've taken jobs for money. Now, I would say from experience, not a wise thing to do. Don't take a job for money, and here's why. The money, you know, people always say money won't buy happiness. Well, it certainly unlocks a new level on Maslow's hierarchy, right, sometimes. <laughs> but that being said, you're eventually still going to have the money, but you're, 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 not going to be, you're not going to be as happy as you used to be. And in the field of positive psychology, there's a term for this. And they call it the a hedonic treadmill, right? And the idea is like a treadmill, you're not getting anywhere. Everyone has a certain happiness set point that they are going to gravitate towards. This is why you see people in appalling conditions with smiles on their faces that can be happy and laugh. Because they trend towards their 
happiness set point, whether or not they're in a miserable state of affairs or not. Likewise, you may get a temporary boost in happiness from a significant salary increase, but eventually if the work is not rewarding, if you're not passionate about what you're doing, then the happiness level trends toward normal again, and even though you have more money, you're right back where you started and maybe actually less happy because you've got, you're now not as happy with the job, right? You don't like what you're doing as much. So you take it for the wrong reasons, you're probably gonna regret it. And while we're talking about treadmills, um, I didn't exercise for most of my life, frankly. I was never, I know it's gonna be hard to believe, I was never athletic. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of assumed it was too late. I remember telling people, this is like sort of morbid when I think about it now, but like, I'm probably not gonna live past 30. Like, and that's all right, because like, honestly, it's all downhill from there anyway. And, <laughs> and I mean, so I, I looked at it kind of like, I really didn't think um, I could change, right? I would encourage you, whether it's exercise or something else, not to assume it's too late. Um, about uh, a little over a year and a half ago, I started working out. And I got back to my, the pant size I had in high school, but 30 pounds heavier, so my body composition changed. I feel better about myself. Um, I'm more confident when I'm around people now. Um, I can run if I need to without feeling like, you know, winded at the end of, you know, the edge of that stage, which is great. These are all things that are worth doing. Um, what I would say is, um, no matter what it is that you've been putting off, it's never too late. You can always start, right? You can start and see how far you get. You might be surprised by how, how quickly you get results. Another thing that I'd like to uh, discourage is getting too comfortable. Um, in a job that I had uh, with a cable company for a long time, um, there really weren't a lot of developers. In fact, I was the only developer on my team. And so it's really easy to start to get into a mode where you sort of feel like, oh, you know, I can do no wrong, and it's not like anybody else can call me on it anyway, because they're not developers. What are they going to do? And it, it was a period of probably, I want to say seven years. I wasted most of my 20s, frankly, working at jobs that didn't challenge me, working at jobs that didn't have people that held me to a higher standard. And I regret it now. This is not intended to be depressing. It's coming off a little depressing. Um, but what I'm saying is, don't allow yourself to get too comfortable. In fact, if you get too comfortable, Seek out something that's, that's gonna challenge you. Find something, even if it's not in the job that you're working in right now, that's gonna stretch you in a new way. Um, it's being uncomfortable. These guys, these guys look really comfortable. How, is hayride, are hayrides a thing in, in Utah? Yes. Okay, so where I grew up, I was in southwestern Pennsylvania, a very rural area. Hayrides were a thing. And um, when I was a kid uh, in, in junior high, um, I want to say like eighth grade or something. Um, I went on a hayride, and it was a hayride and a bonfire. And this is like where you met people uh, that you might be interested in dating, right? At, you know, junior high, what's dating, right? Like holding hands in, in the hallway. Now it's probably more. Um, <laughs> so, so you know, it's a hayride. It's a bonfire. But you know, this is not me, uh, and this sure as heck wasn't me. I know this may be hard for you to believe, but I was not in junior high, the paragon of cool that I am now. <laughs> My stepdaughter certainly, certainly uh, believed that I'm cool. Um, this was me. Yeah! Rich, rich mullet. Oh yeah, I see Aaron up there taking a shot of this. That's great. Uh, right. So, <laughs> so in this hay, I went to this hayride. I'm sitting there on the you know back of the wagon, you know, doing what you do on hayrides, which is not a lot. And afterwards, we get back, and they have like cocoa, and they have like marshmallows, and we're doing this whole bonfire thing. And I'm doing what I do best, which is essentially this on the edge of a wall on the building, um, hoping nobody notices me. And uh, two uh, attractive young ladies came over and started talking to me. Um, of course, rapidly, rapidly, of course, I, I think, well, crap, this was unexpected. What do cool people do? 
I know what cool, I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding you, this is literally what I'm thinking. As the, I'm not hearing what they're saying to me at this moment. I'm thinking, how can I do something cool? I know what cool people do. This is, this is all I know that cool people do. They prop their legs up on the wall like this, like, I don't care, you know, I'm just comfortable. So I decide I'm going to do that. And uh, as it happens, <laughs> they had a basement window exactly where I was standing. And I sent shards of glass down onto some poor unsuspecting grandmothers who were down there making hot cocoa for us. Needless to say, no numbers were gotten that evening. And I still do this today. I still, no, not this, but I mean, <laughs> I try to be someone I'm not. And I think we all do that to some degree. Um, there's there's kind of deep down in us, and this is, I think, really, if I'm being honest about myself, I'm afraid you guys won't like me, right? I think... I'm going to get up here, and they're going to be like, ah, he's just talking about himself. He's got nothing for us. Or I'm afraid that I don't know as much as I'd like to think that I know or that you might find out that I don't know. Um, and I would say to you what I told my stepdaughter, which is don't live two lives. It's way too hard living one already. If you're consistent, you know, people pick up on that. I think people pick up on authenticity. Um, people are more perceptive than you think. And I think it really all comes down to fear, right? Um, there are reasonable fears. There are fears like, I'm afraid that if I punch that grizzly bear in the face, he might eat me, right? That's a reasonable fear to have. It's, it's going to preserve your life. And then there are unreasonable fears like, I like all of you, but if you don't like me, I'm probably not going to die tomorrow, right? So it's, it's, it's kind of pointless to get afraid about things that you aren't going to suffer serious repercussions for. Um, not only that, um, I think part of us wants to be the hero in regular, in regular situations. Like, I want to be the person that's like got all the answers and got all the tools, right, to make things happen, right? And so I don't want to say no, right? If I say no, then somebody might think that I don't know how to do this. And so I was really bad at saying no when I first started software development. I would do things that were horrible ideas, Absolutely awful ideas, but I didn't want them to think I couldn't do them, so I'd be like, I'll show them, I'll do this awful thing. And what I've come to realize now, and I've gotten a lot better at saying no, is that what you say no to is what defines what you can say yes to, right? And like, this is a real, I thought this was a really gorgeous sculpture that came up when I did a search for some images. And, you know, when a sculptor makes something, right, he makes it by taking out what doesn't belong, right? Saying no is what actually kind of defines the boundaries that define who you are, right? What will you say no to? Where are your boundaries? Um, I'm running a little over, so I'm going to try to speed this along. Um, I also have this problem where the things that I say, I think nobody is going to find very revealing. For instance, I love, I love this, this warning label. This is on a bag of peanuts. Contents, peanuts, 100%. <laughs> Letting you know, if you're allergic to peanuts, you probably shouldn't eat these peanuts. Right? I got really afraid of sharing things because I was worried that people would be like, well, yeah, Captain Obvious, that's very helpful, thank you so much. Case in point, there was this little gem that I agonized over. It took me all of two hours to write because it was a pattern that I was doing all the time where I was like, I don't want active record instantiation because it's kind of expensive. I really just need these two values that I'm going to iterate through and render in a table, let's say, or something like that. And so I wrote this little gem, and I released it, and it like, it like blew up for some reason. Everybody was like, like, you probably know this as Pluck now, which is not my code, but it's a very reasonable facsimile of it that's in, in Rails proper. And it's the same basic behavior, right? When I first announced this, I thought, oh, people are going to say, you're wasting your time. And then I saw this comment. I want to draw your attention to the fact that there was somebody out there who actually, to solve this problem, and he didn't have the same knowledge of Active Record that I did, and so the way that he solved it was to fork off processes that spawned all these active record instances and then reap them afterwards, kill the processes off. Like, that was a solution, right? So what's obvious to you may not be obvious to someone else. I wrote this blog post the other day. Um, not the other day, I guess at this point, a few weeks back, right? And it's like the most active blog post that I've written in probably three or four months. I spent literally five minutes typing it up, right? Um, I'd like to point out, too, the uh, you-know-what-to-do comment, mainly because uh, when it blew up, probably my favorite mention of it at all was this one right here. First comment's excellent. 
the, uh, the post is fine as well. In, in all honesty, <laughs> it was pretty great. Um, Aaron pretty much wins at comments. Um, so don't be afraid to share. Don't be afraid to share. You, you'd be surprised what people don't know. Um, and um, years ago, probably three years ago, you know how you fill those forms out, it's like, what are my goals for the next year? And you, you give them to your employer, and then supposedly they use them to gauge whether or not you're an effective employee. I was telling people I wanted to speak by the end of the year. But I was only telling my boss, and frankly, they weren't going to pay for me to go to conferences back then anyway. So it was like, I did a lightning talk, and I was like, yeah, I spoke. And like, that totally was my way of lying to myself. Like, I know what I meant when I wrote it. I know that I meant, like, actually give a talk, but I was afraid to do it. Um, it took me a long time to get over that. Don't be afraid to speak. Again, it's just another firm of sharing. And, you know, yeah, there are more of you than whenever I'm sitting at a table over dinner. But, I mean, when you get up here, nobody wants to see somebody completely tank, right? So you're on my side, at least I hope. Nobody's throwing Roderick, Roderick II at me yet, so... <laughs> Um, so, so what, how did I actually overcome this and how can you overcome this, right? For me, I posted it on the blog, right? And I, January 1st, I said, this is what I'm going to do. And like three weeks later, I had my first speaking engagement. Um, you need to seek accountability for the things that you want to accomplish in life. Find someone that you can trust. In my case, it's the entire internet, apparently. Um, <laughs> I suck at boundaries. Um, but in the end... I mean, I got to go to Moscow and speak last year. I got to keynote RubyConf last year. I had never spoken as January of last year. Frankly, I didn't deserve to do any of these things. But all I did was try. And that's all you really have to do. So I guess what I'd say is, like Roderick II, don't be afraid to stretch. Thanks very much. <laughs>